All right. So we want to welcome everybody here today and also our online community. We've got, uh, if you've been following along with us or if you're a guest, that's our pastor. He's not actually at that beautiful place, but he is on a sabbatical. That's green screen. Jessica in the back is to thank for that. She's very talented. But he's on a sabbatical, and he has been resting. So he has eight speakers that have spoken, first and second service. There's two different messages, and you can see those on YouTube if you want to go back and watch. And he has allowed them to come up here because he has so much faith in what they have to say. And we're just going along with the series. His next speaker for today I get to introduce is somebody that you might see over here during children's worship. He's the one dancing. He has a youthful spirit that he just loves on kids. And it's you can't, you can't not laugh or smile when he's around because he is just such a presence. Our next speaker for today is Mr. Scott Ferris. Thank you all. Well, I don't know about you, but man, worship every time. It just, <laughs> it gets me. We have got such a talented group of individuals up here to just bring the Holy Spirit into this house. It is such, a, such an honor to come in here and just get ushered into his presence, you know? Well, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope everyone's having a good morning. Good morning, online community. Welcome to Thrive Community Church. I hope uh, everybody's going to have a chance to enjoy um, what, what the good Lord is bringing today. And as Ashley was saying, that we've, we're in a series called Jesus Is, and there's been great speakers up here. And rather than me recapping what everybody has said, I'm just going to kind of touch on a little bit about last weekend, because both Nicole and Christian brought great messages and I got to tell Nicole, I wish she was here because I could look at her and go, I kind of wanted that, that, there she is, there she is. I kind of wanted that builder one because I'm a, I'm a cabinet maker by trade and I'm a remodeler and I do all kinds of handiwork type of things. And I thought to myself, oh man, I was thinking if I get the builder, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to get my, my, my tool belt. I'll come up here on stage with my, with my tool belt on, and I'll work on building something as, as I talk. And the more I listened to Nicole and what she had to say, I was thinking to myself, Scott, you, you probably wouldn't have done a real good job. So Nicole just brought a great message with the, with the builder. And I will tell you, too, when she talked about the cornerstone, whoo, that resonated with me. Because me as a builder or remodeler, anybody knows if they've got a project, they have to start somewhere. You have to have a point of reference so that the rest of the project goes well. Well, when she talked about that cornerstone being cut precisely and set just in the right place so that they can build the rest of the structure, man, that, that stuck with me. That stuck with me. And then it was followed up by Christian, and Christian just did a great job communicating to us about Jesus being the ladder and how we can only have a relationship with our Heavenly Father through that ladder. And he is such a great communicator. We're so, so blessed to have him, not only as a communicator, but up here on this platform to bring, to bring in the worship. And as he was talking, I was listening, he got towards the end of his message a little bit, and then he, he talked about laying those things down that you have in your hands, laying them down so you can hold on to the ladder. That stuck with me. Because we all have stuff that we bring into the house, don't we? We've all walked into these doors with something on our hearts. Yeah, Ashley even talked about it this morning. Just lay it down so we can hold on to that rung. Hold on to Jesus. So my subject that um, I've been asked to talk about is Jesus is the Son. Jesus is the Son. So have you ever really thought about Jesus being God's Son? I mean, we all, we all know it. We all read it in Scripture. But I've, quite honestly, I've never really thought a whole lot about that until, until now, really. And I'm blessed enough to have three beautiful kids, and I just cherish the relationship that I have with them. 
And then I think about the relationship that the father has with his son. I mean, that just must be unbelievable. And then I think about how much, how much do you think he loved us to give up his one and only son? I mean, that's just, that's just unfathomable to me. So um, even, even give it up for us, but not only us, for, but for the people that didn't even care about Jesus. You know, um, Jesus went into Jerusalem, and yeah, there was a whole bunch of people there that were probably wishy-washy. Yeah, he's the carpenter's son. I don't know, maybe he's a prophet, maybe he's not, maybe he's the Messiah, maybe he's not. You know, so there were people out there that didn't, didn't have a whole lot of high opinion of him. And of course, then you look at the Pharisees, and well, they hated him. They didn't want any part of him because they were rocking his world. But God, God gave up his son for all of us, all of those people, which is just crazy to think about. Yeah, so let's take a look at, at kind of the relationship that, that God has with his, with his son, Jesus. In Matthew 3.17, it says, And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. How would you like to hear those words? Huh? <laughs> I mean, with words of affirmation? Wow, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, tell me when you, you wouldn't love to, love to have that, that blessing on your, on your life when God, the creator, is saying, you're good. You're good. I did good when I made you. I did real, real good. Yeah. So, the, I mean, the, the words, when, we, when our Heavenly Father speaks to us, they just take on a whole different meaning, don't they? People can tell us things, but when you get in your quiet space with the Lord and you start to hear from the Lord, that just, that just resonates with you. That goes, that goes deep into your heart. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Jesus being the Son and the Father who gave up his Son. I'm going to talk on three, three points. One, he was given. Two, he was sacrificed. And three, he was raised. So let's look at how he was given. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The next verse is John three sixteen. This is probably the most widely spoken, the most memorized verse in the Bible. All of us could probably repeat it. If with our eyes closed. So it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Many versions, many versions of this passage has the word begotten Son. Why it's in some and not in others, I'm not a theologian. I don't, I don't know how, why that is. But I think it we could take a moment to pause and, and look at that word begotten because I think it has some significance, especially because it's in some verses and it's not in, not in others. Well, begotten means to produce an offspring as a father produces or procreates. The, the Greek version of this word is monogenous. Monogenous means unique, only, one and only. So if we look at so if we look at that word begotten through the Greek lens, it kind of takes on a whole, new, a whole new perspective. It puts Jesus at a whole new level because he's from one God and there's only one Jesus. So what are some of the other ways that we think about Jesus? When we're in our quiet time, how do we, how do we perceive him? I know for me, as I've read the Old Testament and the New Testament, I always kind of look at Jesus and think, he's the, he's, the, he's the gentle one, he's the peacekeeper one, he's the one that brings, brings good words. And God the Father is kind of the mean one. You look at the Old Testament, especially with as much, <laughs> with as much um, fatalities and killings that went on in there, you go, oh my gosh. I mean, he's, he's just got to be one mean God. But let's not forget it was God the Father who gave, who gave his only son. So 
they've had a long relationship. I mean, they've been had a father father son relationship for eons of time, long before we were even a part of the picture. So my imagination goes a little wild here a little bit. So you think, okay, they've got this whole universe as a playground. You know, what are, what are the father and son doing? I mean, I know what I do with, with, with my boy when he was growing up. What do, you think, what do you think God and Jesus are doing? They got the whole universe. I mean, earth, earth could be a big giant ball of, of Play-Doh. You know, you want to make some mountains? Well, well, we'll make some mountains. You want to make a river? You know, Jesus takes his finger and makes a river. Oh, how about a canyon? You know, you dig on out, make the Grand Canyon. You know, I mean, it, it's unlimited. If they wanted something, they just created it. You know, how, how awesome would that be? And so we just, we just look around at all of his handiwork and what he's done, and it's awfully plain to see. So they're, they're doing their creative thing. They're just enjoying one another and creating all the time. And then they want to create us. They're, they're capstone, their greatest creation ever. So they create man. And we all know the story didn't probably go like what we wanted it to. We had our free will and we, we botched it. So, so the father goes, okay, well, we got to come up with a plan because I've got to bring them all back to me. So I've got to come up with a plan. So how much love would it take for God to give up his son? How about giving him up for a stranger? You know, I talked a little bit about um, the Pharisees and the the people that were kind of wishy-washy. How about for the people that didn't even care? How much love would that take from the father to give up his son to do that for us? For us. I think about the relationship that I have with my kids, and I just... I just cherish that, just like I said earlier. We've got three beautiful kids. Our first one is Lauren, and uh, she took a little while to uh, show her face on earth here. My poor wife, Stephanie, was in labor for about 23 hours, and uh, then she finally arrived. But before that time, she, she was a forceps baby, and so I see the doctor you know, putting those forceps around her head. I'm going, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And then I see the doctor pulling on her a little bit, and I can see the muscles in his arm pulling on her. I'm like, what are you doing to my child? You know, I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to this? So Lauren enters the world, and unbeknownst to me, I didn't realize what the forceps could do to a soft skull. And so (laughs) anyway, she shows up, And it's like somebody took a bandana around her head and it just pulled really tight and the top of her head popped up. And the physician goes, oh, isn't this a beautiful child? And I go, yeah, she's beautiful. I'm like, oh my God, what's wrong with her, you know? (laughs) Well, the next day she had this beautiful round head and everything. So at any rate... They, t- they take her over, put her in, the, put her in the, uh, the warmer over there, and so I go on over there, and I'm just over the top of her, and I'm just talking to her, telling her how much I love her, and rubbing her arm and everything, and I'm just thinking to myself, this child is mine. This belongs to me. And I'm thinking, how do all those parts fit in there? I mean, the little heart, the lungs, all the bones and everything, but they do. They're in this small little package. It was just unbelievable to think about. Well, then our second one, two years later, Caitlin shows up. And Kate, if you're watching online, Daddy-O gives you a big hug. Big hug to you, sweetie. So anyway, two years later, Kate shows up. Five pushes, boom, she's out, she's rolling, she's ready to go. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And she, she has got the most free-spirited temperament about her. It's crazy. It's kind of funny because Lauren, it took her eight months before she would let Steph and I put her in somebody else's arms. She wouldn't even be held. Kate, it didn't matter. The neighbor, stranger, mom, dad, grandpa, it, she, was, she was rolling. Yeah, it didn't matter. As long as somebody was holding her and loving on her, she was good to go. And she still has that great free spirit today. And that's one of the wonderful things that we just love about her. She's just 
such a lover of people, and she'll be the first one to come around people that maybe have been pushed off to the side or neglected a little bit, put her arm around them and just love on them and give them, bring them light into their life. So another two years goes by, and boom, our son Ryan shows up. So I'm in the, I'm in the delivery room there, and all of a sudden, boom, here comes Ryan. We didn't know, we never asked what gender any of our kids were going to be. So Ryan shows up, and it's a boy, and the first thing I thought of was, got my boy, I got my boy. Yeah, you fathers out there know that if you've got a, you've got a son, that's kind of, what you're, that's kind of what you're thinking. And then the second thought was, oh my gosh, I've got, I've got this instant connection. This is my son. He's, he's my namesake. He's carrying on the name, the family name, you know. I, I can't wait to play in the mud with him and, and teach him how to use some of my tools and mow the grass and do all that other fun stuff. And... Uh, to be with him on athletic events and things like that. Well, uh, my fam- I'm a hockey player. I know it's not a big thing around here and that down here in the southern states, but I grew up in Illinois, and I'm a hockey player. And uh, my son played travel hockey for 10 years, and I was fortunate enough to be his uh, assistant coach there. But I want to tell you, my girls played hockey, too, for about four or five years. So they are some tough nuts. They know the game, and they know what it takes to play. Yeah, and they know that dad kind of had a high expectation for them to do, to do well and not complain and just go out there and get her done, and they did. So at any rate, my son and I had a lot of trips together, and we would travel up to the Chicago land and down to St. Louis, and we had a lot of, a lot of car time together, and just being able to be, um, have some camaraderie with, with the boys that he was growing up with. So I was truly blessed to be able to do that. And then... I want to talk a little bit about the relationship that I had with my dad. My dad was a, was a very good man. We had a, we had a pretty good relationship growing up. He was always there for me, good, bad, and different. I got myself into trouble a few times, you know, experimented with life and got, you know, paid some of the consequences. I think everybody kind of understands that a little bit, but he was always there. And sometimes, sometimes, he had a little trouble showing his love towards me because he would point out kind of the things that weren't versus the things that were. I think he kind of understand what I'm talking about. But as I grew older, I understood that his intentions were always the best for me. He just wanted the best for me. He always wanted me to do well. And I understand that. Well, our Heavenly Father always wants the best for us as well. His sacrifice on our behalf was having his son sacrificed. This leads us into the next aspect of Jesus being the son. He was sacrificed. Matthew 16, 21 says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised again. Scripture tells us that there were a number of times when Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be sacrificed. So the question is, why didn't the disciples go, hey, don't go? You know what I mean? Don't go. I never, I never really thought about that too much, but let's put it in today's world. Let's, let's, everybody knows the story about JFK. He goes down to Dallas. Suppose JFK said, oh, yeah, let's put this trip together. We're going to go down to Dallas, and I'm going to ride through the streets, and oh, by the way, I'm going to be assassinated. Well, most of his people, his entourage is going to say, well, don't go. You know, it's pretty simple. How about Martin Luther King? I've got a daughter and son-in-law and a grandson that live in Memphis, and he goes down there to try to straighten things out down there. And so how would you, what would you think his people would say if he goes, well, yeah, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to see what good I can do down there. And, oh, by the way, I'm going to get assassinated. Well, no, don't go. It's pretty simple. So why did Jesus need to be sacrificed? Have you thought about that a whole lot? Amen. Amen. 
I, I never thought a whole lot about it. I've just read scripture and just, just kind of glazed over a little bit. The reason is because he had to become our propitiation. You ever heard that word before? I think I've heard it, but I don't think I've ever spoke it. That's a big word, and it's very hard for me to get out of my mouth. Propitiation. Propitiation. It, it, basically, it basically means an atoning sacrifice. I'll get into the, into the meeting a little bit more, a little bit later. But let's look at 1 John 2.2. 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 4.10 says, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Well, and here's another, another word, since I'm on the subject of, you know, big words, words that I don't use very often, expiation. Expiation, both expiation and propitiation have to do with sin, and that's the, that's the big difference. Expiation looks at sin from a sinner's perspective. The definition of, of expiation is that our sins have been expelled, expiation, expelled or removed. But propitiation looks at sin from God's perspective. God's perspective is that justice has been completely served. So the definition of propitiation, I can't even get it out. Yeah, this is why I don't use it very often. Yeah, means that God's wrath has been completely satisfied and that justice has been completely served. Kind of brings a greater depth to the, to the meaning, doesn't it, of the verse. Yeah, well, so let's put this in kind of today's terms. So let's, let's say somebody wrongs you. Let's say there was a crime committed against you for some reason or another. And they go through the whole court process and, so, process and everything and find the, find the person guilty. But then somebody else steps in and serves that sentence. Would well, you feel like you'd be justified? Do you think that justice would have been done? Probably not. Probably not. So let's look at it another way. So let's say three, four years goes by, they find the guy, they they get the guy that really did commit the crime, they've got all new footage of him committing the crime, there's no doubt he is the one, so he gets sentenced, and he's in in jail. Do you think justice would be done then? Probably so. We'd probably think, yeah, justice has been served. Yeah. So Jesus took our punishment and our sin. He became the atoning sacrifice for us, our propitiation. So it was the penalty was served in full. This was the only way that the penalty could be served in God's eyes, in his perspective. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm going to start to transition a little bit into my into the third third topic, and let's look at First First Thessalonians 1:10. And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Let's pause a moment and look at the word rescues. I find it very interesting how Scripture can talk to us sometimes. And if we look at the little words that are in the, in the scriptures, they can resonate with it. Rescues is a verb. Notice it didn't say rescued. So it's not like God has already rescued his people and he likes the one, he's picked the ones that he likes and the rest of us are on our own. That's not the case. He's rescuing. That means he's still working today. He's still active in rescuing people. This should bring a lot of hope to us. We know that Jesus wants all the people rescued. And we know that there's a lot of people out there that still need Jesus. Well, the good news is he's still rescuing today. Amen to that. Yes. And he was also raised. He was noticed in the tense of the word raised. This is past tense. 
That means Jesus was already raised. It was already done. That work on the cross and him raising is over with. It's history. It's for our benefit. Yeah. So let's take a look at the last aspect. He was raised. John 21, 14 says, this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples that he was raised from the dead. Acts 5.30 says, The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging on a tree. Jesus was on the earth for 40 days after he had risen. And in Mark 16.14, it, it shows us, it explains to us, Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. No doubt that he had been raised. I mean, he spent three years with his eleven of his closest confidants, the disciples, shoulder to shoulder, day in, day out. They were eyewitnesses to this account. There is no doubt, there is no question that he has been raised. This, my friends, is great news. We've got eyewitness accounts. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 6.14. By his power, God raised the, the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Notice the, notice the tense of the word raise. It's future tense. He will raise. That's good, that's good news. There's hope. That tells us that it's still happening. He is still raising people. Yes. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. 2 Corinthians 4, 14 has some good words for us as well. Because we know that the one who has raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. I got to tell you, being raised from the dead is not a subject that I've thought a whole lot about, especially in my younger years. But now that I'm getting more of these gray hairs and things are sagging a little bit, the closer I get to the finish line, the more it becomes apparent, the more I think about what that means and the greater meaning of what that is. And that gift, that gift of death, death, to life, I have embraced. It is probably the, it, not probably, it is, it's the single best decision that I've ever made in my life. The second was marrying my wife, Stephanie. I'm still a work in progress. I'm still on the journey. I'm still learning how to, how to live this life. There is still time, there is still time for everyone to be a part of his, his kingdom. There is still time, he is still raising, he is still letting people in. I mean, saying yes to Jesus is pretty doggone easy. Scripture shows us that. If he made it hard, none of us would, would have done it, right? Yes. So saying yes to Jesus is a great start. Kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of like your ticket into heaven, but I don't know anybody that's gone to Disney and bought a ticket and then just walked inside the front gate and stood there. There's a whole world out there. All that in Disney is there for you. There's a whole world that Jesus wants to hand you, that he wants, you to, he wants to give to you. Yeah, is it always going to be sweet and lovely? No, it's not. But guess what? He already knows the plans. Whatever obstacle he's going to throw in your way, he's already got a plan for you to overcome it. It's, it's already there. And it is so easy to accept that gift. Romans 10.9 shows us how. Pretty simple. And I got to tell you, since I work with four and five-year-old kids, as it was explained earlier, sometimes um, we like to do things so that kids can remember memory verses. I remember when my wife Stephanie and I started ministry many, many years ago, we always had different hand gestures or things that we were doing for the help the kids um, memorize the verse. 
So I'm going to present Romans 10.9 in a way that hopefully it might stick with you a little bit more. And if my family's watching, which I think they are, I think they're going to get a big kick out of this. So Romans 10.9. So it goes Romans 10. Nine, oops, oh, ten, nine, that we, <laughs> I don't even, I can't even count, yeah, that if we confess with our mouth and believe Jesus is Lord and he, he is raised from the dead, you will be saved. So hopefully Romans 10, 9 will stick with you a little bit, a little bit better. Well, I want to share just one more, one more story with you. Um, because this verse has a very special meaning for me. Uh, my father passed away last October. He was 90 years old. He's lived a good, full life, and I was blessed enough to be able to share a lot of things with him before he passed. So I'm very peaceful about his, about his passing. But at any rate, while we were in the hospital, I was able to be bedside with him for a number of days. And all I could think about was this verse. And I just kept thinking about it. And pretty soon, one day when I was by his bedside, the good Lord goes, remind him. Tell him. Remind him. So I asked my dad, I said, Dad, do you, do you believe in Jesus? Have you asked Jesus into your heart? And he said, I don't know how to do that. So I let him in a little prayer. And then I said, Dad, do you, do you believe in God? And boom, I mean, he... He's story after story of what, how God has worked in his life. And I'm like, yes, that's all I could think about was is he, he accepted Jesus into his heart and he confessed with his mouth and he will be saved. That was just super, super comforting for, to me. What a blessing that, what a blessing that was. So as I mentioned earlier, I have an overwhelming love for my family, and I think that I would, I would give anything for my, for my family. I would take a bullet for them. And I learned long ago that the best protection that I could give my, my family was turning them over to Jesus. That was the best gift that I could give them to protect them because I can't do it on my own. And as much love as I can muster up for my family and for God, it has no comparison, no comparison to the love that the Heavenly Father has for you and for me. And I think to myself, how much love does it take for him to sacrifice his son so that we can hop on that ladder and have that relationship with our Heavenly Father so we can spend all eternity with Him. That's, that's awesome. Well, let's, let's wrap this up. Let's wrap this up and hopefully something that you can, you can take with you, a belief, a truth, something that you can, you can hold on to as you walk out these doors. We know from eyewitness accounts and so many other passages in the, in the Bible of Jesus being God's, God's son. He was, he was given up for us. He was sacrificed. And he was raised. So now, we get to do our part. He's done his part. We get to do our part. We need to give ourselves back to him so that we can show the rest of the world who Jesus is. Yes. Have yourselves a great day. What do you say we close out with just declaring that God is always up to something good? Let's worship.
job, Scott. All right, I'm going to call our prayer team up because as if you were here first service and then also it was mentioned kind of weaved in, if you brought something in, don't take it home. Come let this prayer team pray and love on you, okay? Brought my phone up here because we're going to pray over our tithe and offering. We pray over it every week because we want to make sure that it is blessed and that it has God's blessing all over it. So if you give it in a envelope, if you give it in your phone, however you give it, just, just raise it up as a, as a representation. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the light of the world. You are the guider to our path. We know that your word says that everything on earth belongs to you, that we belong to you, and that you have given us everything that we have. So we want to give a little bit of what you have already given us back to you. So we offer our tithes to you, and we ask that you bless it, and that you guide it and you put it where you need it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, a reminder, we've got the kids' car wash out there, so if you've got a dirty car wash or got a dirty car, you can go see them. And we pray that you have a blessed day. Have a good day.